this uh, session will be recorded for marketing and archival purposes as well. If you didn't come for yesterday's session, um, this program, as mentioned, is organized by SCAPE as well as AWS. And SCAPE Entrepreneurship really is here to develop the next generation of youth entrepreneurs and startups by offering them access to co-working and hot desking spaces on top of developmental programs such as this and like business pitches, workshops and networking sessions. AWS Educate is then Amazon's global initiative to provide students and educators with the resources needed to greatly accelerate cloud-related learning endeavors and to help power the entrepreneurs, workforce, and researchers of tomorrow. So this collaboration between Scape and AWS X is a great way for us to reach aspiring entrepreneurs such as yourself, and we're so happy that we're able to potentially be a part of your startup journey. Once again, just a reminder, if you haven't signed up for your AWS Educate account, please do so um, as soon as you can because you will need it for your startup batch as well as further learning after this bootcamp. If you also have friends or peers that are coming down to join us, please do. If they did come yesterday as well, please remind them to log on because um, if not, they won't get access to the virtual career fair link. All right, just to recap the program structure, especially if you didn't come down yesterday. Um, so our program is structured using the AWS Educate Startup module that you can access once you sign up for your account. And in the first two days, we'll be covering all six modules, as you can see here, through the use of keynotes, workshops, panels, as well as fireside chats with entrepreneurs as well as industry professionals. On the third day, you'll get access to the AWS Virtual Career Fair, where you'll be able to continue to build your skills through working with and accessing corporates and tech firms. So as you can see on the screen right now, here are the few partner companies that will be available during the Virtual Career Fair tomorrow that all of you will gain access to. So please do note that the access link to the Virtual Career Fair will only be released at the end of today's session. So you have to stay to the end to get the access link. Post bootcamp as well, you'll be able to receive an exclusive Scape X AWS t-shirt and participation certificate. So do note that this shirt and certificate will only be provided to attendees that complete and receive the startup batch on the AWS Educate platform, which is why it's really important for you guys to go sign up for the AWS Educate account. So the redemption method for both will also be reviewed at the end of today's session. So just to recap what we have, what happened yesterday, if you didn't come or if you did come and you just want a quick reminder. So we covered the first three topics of the AWS Educate Startup module, which is getting started as a founder, customer discovery and development, as well as building your MVP. So we had an intro on the AWS Educate platform as well. And the AWS team covered the different topics you could learn on the platform on top of the startup module, which includes things like cloud computing, machine learning, data science, and many, many others. So you can just continue your learning or learn even more things on top of the startup uh, module. So do continue to explore it as much as you can. So the recording from yesterday's session will also be uploaded on Scape's platform, in particular our YouTube channel, at a later date, just in case you weren't able to attend or you just need to recap some of the learnings that were there yesterday. So today we'll look at the final three topics in the AWS Educate Startup module, which is legal fundamentals, how to fundraise, as well as growth strategies and company culture. So we'll start off with a panel on legal fundamentals and then we'll later move to a fireside chat on how to fundraise and then following that we'll have a short break which will allow you to recharge, grab a snack, anything you need. So after your break we'll move into a panel on growth strategies and company culture and which is also the last topic we'll cover. Finally we'll go into how to redeem your t-shirt and certificate which I'm pretty sure that's something that all of you guys want to know as well as directions on how to access the AWS Virtual Career Fair and the whole walkthrough. So finally, to wrap up your learning, we'll have a small activity that will kind of consolidate what you have learned over the past two days. Um, last but not least, please remember to, if you have any questions about the AWS Educate platform, you can always use the Q&A function to put down your questions um, for us and the internal team will just help to answer your questions throughout the whole session. So to really get the most out of this bootcamp, please remember to stay focused on your learning as always. If possible as well, please use a laptop or computer to access the webinar. That's the best way to really get all the knowledge out of today's session. Um, if you do have any questions for the speakers, we do have a few panels today. So um, you can use the Q&A function to really put in your questions instead of chat. That really helps us you know, consolidate all the questions as well. 
Um, if you have questions for a particular speaker, um, please use the format speaker then question. It really helps the moderators as well as the speakers really get to your question a little bit quicker. And that is about it for our intro. So without further ado, let's jump into our very first panel. And I believe some of our, I believe all our speakers are already here. So if um, speakers, if you could just help me just on your camera, if you could. Uh, let me see. Let me see if all of you are here. Awesome. Hi, Joshua and Anissa Tia, Samantha Tia, Ryan Tia. That's amazing. Yes. So I hope you guys are having a wonderful afternoon so far. Today we have Anissa Castillo, Associate Legal Counsel at Lozada Group, Ryan Edningo, Director of Advisory from Forbes Accounting, Joshua Tan, Partner Corporate Practice from Equinus Law, and Samantha Lowe, Corporate Counsel from Amazon Web Services. This panel will be moderated by myself. So yes, hello. Um, before we start, could we just do a really short introduction of yourselves and maybe what you guys do and also the companies that you are in? Um, we can start from Anissa, then go down the line. So ending with Samantha. Um, Anissa? Sorry, on mute, Anissa. <laughs> no, I think you muted me, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Hi everyone. Pleasure to be here. Um, hello to the fellow panelists. Um, my name is Anisa. Uh, I joined Lazada about in 2014. Um, joined a legal team that were uh, back then I was in the regional function, and then I slowly explored some compliance, um, you know, duties as well. And then finally, I decided to make the step to move into the local um, uh, function, the local legal team to work more closely with the uh, operations here. So Lazada, as you know, has been through, um, you know, very big changes. We started out from a startup and right now we are a subsidiary of the Alibaba Group. So I can share with you more about how, um, you know, we became um, really tightly controlled throughout the years and um, how we tried to, you know, comply with um, being a subsidiary of uh, someone that is uh, public, public listed and also with all the changing laws for um, e-commerce platforms. So pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And is that Ryan? Hi, I'm Ryan. Um, wow. Okay, I, I joined Forbes Accounting uh, about a year plus ago. Uh, I started my career off in private equity. Uh, I dealt mostly in foreign markets. So I was based in Africa, India, China for quite a number of years. Uh, came back and moved into the consulting side. Uh, did a lot of project management, things like that. And yeah. So I joined Forbes Accounting last year as a Director of Advisory. Uh, we provide quite a wide range of advisory services from IT, HR, uh, and some market, market fit, market strategy kind of services. So yeah, great to meet you all and uh, looking forward to share more. Thank you so much, Ryan. And Joshua. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, yeah, so uh, Joshua here from, uh, I'm practicing at the Aquinas Law right now. I've been a corporate lawyer basically all my working life and uh, I was uh, in-house counsel at a couple of places before this, uh, startups as well. Um, right now, my practice is very much focused on startups and SMEs and that's why I'm really happy to be here to share what I can and hopefully it'll be helpful for everyone. Very nice to meet the rest of the panelists as well. Thank you so much, Joshua and Samantha. Hi everyone, I'm Samantha. I work for Amazon Web Services um, uh, and I, co I cover the ASEAN region. Um, I have been in Amazon for about two and a half years already. And before that, uh, I spent majority of my um, legal career in actually the banking industry. So um, yeah, if you ask me about outsourcing and, and the like, that's kind of my bread and butter before this. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to all of you about, um, you know, the legal issues that you should be considering about when you are starting a startup. All right. Thank you so much, Samantha. Um, just again, a reminder to all attendees, if at any point in time, if you have any questions, you don't have to wait to the end to do the Q&A. You can just drop them right in the Q&A. And I'll just continuously look at the Q&A um, whenever throughout the panel. And if a question is good and it comes up, I'll just slot it in to any time. So to just, to just start off with a pretty, I guess, general question-ish that I'm going to pose to every single one of our panelists. And if you had to choose just one, what is the one of the most important legal fundamental that startups should pay attention to? And if we maybe we could start with just Joshua and I'll just continuously go. Sure. 
Yeah, uh, thank, thanks a lot for that question. I, I think one of the, the, the main things that I try to uh, make sure that um, you know my clients understand, right, is that, and, and even people who aren't clients, but people who do want to start business, uh, I can understand there's always some sort of inertia, you know, to, to get a lawyer and you don't actually always need a lawyer. So it's very important to just understand this one concept, which is disputes happen due to uncertainty, right? And if you have the opportunity to put something in black and white, to flesh out the thoughts, you know, that both sides have when you're deciding to enter into any form of business arrangement, it's, it's important to do that and just align your expectations, right? You know, um, if let's say you you know you're not engaging any lawyers or whatever, and and but you guys want to do some sort of collaborations, take the pain now to set out the terms you know of of what you guys understand each side to contribute, and it will it will go a long way to preventing a dispute. Yeah, the best agreements that you can see are the ones that reduce the chance of the dispute. Thank you so much. And how about Samantha yourself? Uh, I fully agree. And a strong foundation, in my opinion, is key to creating long-term success. And at the startup phase, that's where um, it is important to put in place all the necessary um, documentations um, to, to really protect your company. And from my perspective, in addition to like a founder's agreement, um, uh, it would also be to protect your assets, for example, your intellectual property. And this starts with your company name. Um, and when picking a company name, it is really important that you do some due diligence uh, to help you avoid, you know, issues like trademark infringements or, or domain name problems. And also ensure that the name that you choose is actually available to use. And in Singapore, it is super easy. Um, the IPOS, which is the Intellectual Property uh, Office of Singapore, and also ACRA, which is the Accounting and Corporate Regulatory Authority in Singapore, they offer such functionalities for you to make sure, well, to check that you know your name is available for use and that is not infringing a third party's trademark. Thank you so much, Samantha. And I think I, I can hear kind of the same things uh, from yourself and Joshua in terms of like, I know you did mention things like founders agreement and, you know, things like protection and Joshua mentioned things like disputes. And, you know, I think these are a few things that founders really have to take note of. Um, these things seem kind of um, general. Um, for Ryan as well as Anissa, I'd like to open up the question to you guys. Do you think there are any specific industries or verticals in which that you think legal fundamentals are inherently more important or do you think legal fundamentals spread out amongst all different startups are, and are as important a lot amongst all different verticals, if you get what I mean? And if so, maybe we start with yourself? Yes, uh, Natalie, thanks. <laughs> I get what you mean. Um, uh, if you were to ask a legal person, I think we would definitely say no matter which industry we, we're in, um, you know, all legal aspects are important. Um, but I think more so for the heavily regulated um, industries. Back then when Lazada started out, we were not so regulated. The laws around uh, e-commerce were not so developed, but right now we can start to see that the laws are actually catching up on us. So mm -hmm. if we didn't have like a good um, base then, if we didn't have a legal team then, it might sort of be hard for the business to kind of catch up. So we are constantly updating the business, you know, what are the developments of the laws, different areas of the regulations, in what way this might implicate um, us one day. So even, um, I, I assume that like banks, pharmaceutical industries, you know, where they already have the law set out for them, it's heavily regulated. Um, that's where, you know, you need to pay attention to all the details. But I wouldn't say that, you know, startups have to or uh, e-commerce companies have to pay less attention to details because you never know one day when the law will apply to you like for mm -hmm. example with the new payment services act in place that kind of like implicates you know a lot of companies out there who are doing who are offering payment services so even though we're not a bank or even though we're not a money lending services the law kind of like updates itself and that's where you know we also find ourselves in that kind of situation so um it's good to have um you know um a legal team or you know external legal counsels legal services helping you out to familiarize you and keep you updated with the laws out there thank you and how about yourself Ryan? your thoughts on this yeah definitely uh, I, I agree with Anissa. like the the basically companies that are in very highly regulated environments i mean including people who want to set up anything dealing with employment mm -hmm. uh you know dealing with finance things like that those are also highly regulated and 
basically last year we advised some of our clients who were this year affected by the Payment Services Act, and basically we asked them to get ahead of it and you know get grandfathered into the program, and basically set out all their licensing, all their documentation even before the program started. So I believe sometimes it's a bit, it's a bit better to preempt the law change rather than wait for it to happen. Because we do have a couple of partner companies that are now in trouble because they actually did not follow, you know, they, they, they didn't keep up with it. They didn't, they just shirked all their legal responsibilities. And now that the PSA is in and then they're like, oh, we can only operate for another six months before we will get shut down. Otherwise, uh, we have to get licensed. So now how? So there, there are cases like that around, I guess. So for me, I would say the biggest takeaway is try to preempt all your legal issues before it happens. Like make it a part of your startup's core considerations. Yeah, before it happens. Thank you. And I think I'm just looking at the Q&A. Thank you for all the questions coming in. They're really amazing. And just continue putting put in your questions if you like. Um, there's a question by an, an anonymous attendee. Um, they did mention that at which stage of a startup should these legal fundamentals become necessary, i.e. setting up a founder's agreement? Um, and I think what um, Ryan hit the nail on the head when he said that, you know, you have to like preempt all your things. But I think for founders, sometimes it's really hard, right, to kind of know exactly when you should do it. And you're like, oh, maybe I should focus more on doing you know building my mvp then when should i do this yeah so when when do you recommend that they actually start to think about you know their these legal fundamentals or you know yeah ryan if you want to comment further about what you mentioned okay yeah definitely for founders agreement i would say they should have it before they start the business don't build an mvp first and then aim to have your founders agreement because by that time right you're going to be arguing. Uh, I've seen a lot of ugly founder breakups where, you know, they will argue and then they'll say, no, I put in more effort than you. You know, my effort is worth more than yours, things like that. Mm. So it should always be set up, uh, you know, especially in the negotiation stage. You know, you should negotiate first and say, okay, I expect you to put X amount of hours into this product. Mm. And therefore, this is your equivalent remuneration. Agree, disagree. If you agree, put it in writing. Don't just do a gentleman's agreement because you cannot expect people to be gentlemen once things move along. Yeah. Thank you. Joshua, how about yourself? I know you worked with a few different startups as well. Do you echo what Ryan thinks? Yes, uh, completely. Ryan was absolutely on point. Um, it's it's very important, right? Uh, as I did mention just now, you know, like, look, if even if you're not going to get an external lawyer, right, just writing out and, and, you know, having some sort of terms of reference between the founders, right, especially when there are multiple founders, of course, uh, you know, it sets out expectations. And when your expectations are clear, you're not going to have, you know, these uncomfortable disputes, or, or rather you reduce the chance that you have these uncomfortable disputes. You have a base to work off from when things need to change, when, you know, things are dynamic, but you at least have that base to work off on. And it really changes a lot. Just going through that one day, that, that process of aligning everybody's roles and responsibilities, remuneration, things like that, it helps a lot. Thank you, Joshua. And then kind of moving um, towards Samantha as well. Somebody asked, sorry, I couldn't catch what Samantha said earlier. Where should we check if we didn't copy a third party or break any law? Um, was this the Acre and IPOS one, if I'm not wrong? Yeah, right. So okay. specifically to trademark, you can actually do a trademark search on the IPOS website. And then Acre also does offer a search functionality for you to check whether or not the, the business name is available, but I would recommend that you do both searches. And following kind of that question, somebody asked about what is the next thing? Um, I guess they think what's the first legal consideration that most startups miss out that must be considered other than registering name, logo in Acre and IPOS. Um, I guess besides that, and maybe the founders agreement, what do you guys think uh, would be the next thing? Maybe Samantha or Anissa could jump in for this. Um, I, I would say the next thing is putting in place a, a good employment agreement for anyone else that's not a founder, but is working for you in the startup and making sure that um, the employment agreement um, deals with stuff like intellectual property, because you would want anyone working for you for that IP um, to, to vest in you, right, the, the business, uh, and obviously confidentiality agreement. 
All right. And yourself, Anissa? Okay, sorry, uh, I've been told to put my mask on because we have like some SDA officers <laughs> in here. But I'll try to do this quick. I'll keep my, <laughs> I'll keep my out. Um, so I think um, uh, another important thing I feel um, would be our contracts, right? With our suppliers, our vendors. Um, I think depending on the business, uh, contractual terms also takes in privacy policy. I mean, depending on the business that you are um, engaging into, I think privacy policy is necessary regardless what business you are into because you know there will be some sort of personal data involved. So having a very um, tightly drafted um, uh, personal data, uh, pri uh, sorry, privacy policy, which then tells the audience, which tell, tell, tells the data subject what you can do with the data. Um, I think it's worth um, uh, investing some time and um, legal efforts into drafting like a comprehensive one. Um, that you can use as templates, um, you know, because it, it, it really protects you when um, things don't go the way that you expected it to, to go. Thank you so much, Anissa. And uh, don't worry, you can put on your mask if you need to. <laughs> no, no stress. I think we usually can hear you through the mask. <laughs> no. um, so I think, um, sorry, there are, very, there are some very good questions, I think, coming from the Q&A. So although I do have our talking points, um, I will try to like mix it up a little bit. Um, there are some questions coming in um, in terms of founders agreement. I think um, Joshua and Ryan, you kind of talking about it a little bit earlier. Um, somebody asked if it's sufficient to agree beforehand in terms of oral agreement, or would you guys recommend more of like a black and white writing down? Um, okay, I'll, I'll just uh, start on this point. Um, yes, I, I think, you know, you can easily Google and see that oral agreements, yes, they are technically enforceable, but the problem always comes down to proof. Uh, and, uh, you know, so if you would ask me to just choose one right now, I'll definitely say, please, please just do black and white. It's, it's not that uh, much more difficult if you're already talking about it. Yeah, just, um, yeah, definitely black and white. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Um, and for Ryan, I think um, the next question coming down is, um, when, what are you referring to when you say black and white writing? Um, is an email fine, a PDF document, or is there like online templates that people can possibly use for like things like founders agreement? Okay, yeah. Online, there are a lot of good boilerplates. Uh, you have to sift through a lot of rubbish to get to the good ones, but there are really great boiler templates provided by law firms for free. Uh, they are like maybe three to four pages long. It's, it's not really long. Uh, email, I don't really recommend <laughs> because similar, you know, there are issues with emails because you don't know the authenticity of the email. You, you know, people can just say, ah, someone locked into my account, you know, things like that. It's not as easy to prove. So usually it would be better to just, you know, create a PDF document, sign off on it. Anyway, now there are a lot of free signing tools online like DocuSign and you know tons of them all over the place. I, I think even uh, SingPass is coming out with a free signing tool now. So it's pretty easy to sign agreements even if you don't want to meet up in person. Uh, but definitely you should download a template at the very least and then prep from there. I would say, I mean, writing it yourself is okay as well. Like you want to write one page, but if you are not trained in that, then I would say definitely download a template from somewhere and really read the template, understand it, look at the terms that you don't understand and try not to use American templates because they use a lot of uh, jargon. Uh, take a template from you know one of the Commonwealth countries like Australia, UK, Singapore, where basically simple English is followed. So it makes it a lot easier for you to do. But if you can and you, know, you can afford it, definitely get a lawyer to do it for you because it saves you a lot of pain and a lot of time. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much. I feel, okay, I'm just going to be a bit casual here, but it, it, it's quite interesting. It seems like, you know, you know, people like hire people for legal counsel. This is like a, a, a very short, quick course if anybody here needs like very quick legal counsel. But anyways, um, yeah. So I think on the topic of signing, um, somebody did ask if all required legal documents needs to be signed off and vetted by an external lawyer if internally there is no legal team. Um, I think maybe, yeah, Joshua, we like to handle because I know Samantha and Anissa, both internal teams as well. Yeah. Sure. Um, the, 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 the answer um, is not so straightforward, right? 
if you want uh, the agreement to be something that you 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 are confident is legally enforceable and actually uh, uh, you know can be brought to court and 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 you know uh, be enforced for what it is intended to be enforced, then that's why you have to incur the cost of a of a legal counsel. Um, the and, and, and yes, actually what happens is that most companies, uh, startups don't have internal legal teams at the start. So you generally will want to look for lawyers whom we, uh, you can establish a relationship with. Um, some other options available to you are to, um, you know, try and get some friends to help. Uh, but one thing I must highlight is if you're not getting a lawyer to, to, um, to vet your agreement, I'm just going back to the first point, which is use that agreement more for a terms of reference. Very often at the startup stage, you're not going to be bringing people to court. Your, your disputes aren't going to be uh, large uh, in uh, a large claim sum such that it's worth it for you to start getting people to go to court and argue over that contract. So the key is really just making sure that there is some level of certainty between the different parties and some level of alignment of expectation. That, that's really, I think, the point that, that should be driven home here. Thank you so much, Joshua. And then I guess just jumping back to the talking points that we had, um, what do you think are some of the more common legal mistakes that startups make? Uh, maybe Anissa, we could start with yourself. And I don't know if you want to pull in some experience that, experiences that you had with Zada at its founding stages. Um, so when I came in, we had a lot of work to do. Um, there was already a legal team uh, then, in, and I was in the regional um, side, right? So we were uh, helping to manage all the other Southeast Asian countries as well. Um, there was a lot of work uh, putting everything together into tractors, um, coming up with repositories, um, a place to store things, templates, um, signed documents. I think... Um, at the startup phase, when you are so focused on, you know, um, you know, putting your business out there, you might miss out the little things of like having proper storage for documents, repositories, you know, at the end of the day, when you want to go through a due diligence process, um, kind of like running around looking for documents, it's not really ideal. Um, I think the best way to do it is to start out having, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, third party service providers who have these tools and um softwares for you that are easy, uh, easy to use to store documents, track documents, track deadlines, you know, licenses expiries, um, document uh, contract expiries. I think having a good system to store all these information is really important. Thank you. And um, Samantha, what about yourself? I would, uh, I would also add maybe um, compliance with applicable laws and specifically if your startup targets say consumers then um, data protection law is super important so in singapore we have the pdpa and it was um, in fact recently amended um, so the maximum penalty under pdpa used to be 1 million it's now more if your annual turnover is more than 10 million but obviously if you are in breach of pdpa um that 1 million dollar fine could put you out of business so and the pdpc um, offers a lot of great resources for startups to get started on compliance with uh, all the obligations under pdpa so make use of those resources thank you samantha yeah uh, ryan how about yourself yeah, I would say uh, compliance, but also from a COPSEC standpoint, actually a lot of startups where they really flop when they go up to Series A or Series B funding is that they have no documents in order, like what uh, Anissa was saying earlier. So we have clients, right, who are looking to raise or they secured an investor, let's say for around 10 to $20 million. And then they realize that none of my documents are in order. I cannot find anything. I have not produced the required documents. And then that's it. The, basically, because it is uh, contingent on them passing the due diligence. Mm. So it, it screws up a lot of things. Then the, the investors, lawyers will demand for this. And then you will have to come up with a list and you have to reproduce documents. And sometimes they've been running for what, six to eight years? So you cannot find the previous accountants or the previous uh, corporate secretaries to sign off on it anymore. And it's just gone now. Like, you just have to find a way to do it, you know, negotiate with the lawyers a little bit. 
and ask them, you know, like that, okay, you know, is this acceptable? Mm. If they say okay, then okay lah. But if they say no, then you know you'll be in real trouble lah at that mm. point. Thank you, Ryan. Joshua, how about yourself? Do you have any other thoughts? Yeah, um, I think that one of the the, the possible problems, and I've, I've seen this a few times, is that at very early stages, uh, when when startups start to get fundraising, um, you know, they may default to using some of the e uh, easier uh, mechanisms like uh, safe notes. I think many people will will be, will be familiar with with what that is, right? Which is a very it's called a simple agreement for future equity, but not actually fully understanding the implications of, uh, of a note like that. And even worse, sometimes they may just meet a couple of angels, um, may sign some terms with them. And, and because they didn't even just run it by a lawyer, you know, it wouldn't be, be, be too expensive or, or better yet if, if you had a friend who was in that industry who would be able to just, you know, let them know the implications of what they're signing. Um, you know, so they tend to then face the consequences later on. Uh, in the future round. So, so once there are agreements with third parties for fundraising, always try to find some way to get some sort of legal help, be it through an external legal counsel, be it through a friend, um, and and of course online resources that's helpful, but preferably for somebody who's actually um, practicing or familiar with something like that, a fellow in-house counsel in another uh, uh, a startup perhaps, right? And uh, or even better, another founder who has gone through something similar. That, that's very important. Thank you, Joshua. And I think um, moving on to, I think uh, Samantha, so you are currently, you know, legal counsel in uh, AWS. Uh, so do you think it's important um, because you are part of the legal team, do you think it is important for all startups to have a legal team in their business? I think that's what Joshua said. You can always go to like other, um, other sources. You can check online. You can talk to other founders. But, you know, like in your opinion, is it important for all startups to have some sort of a legal team in, in, in their startups and I guess what are the benefits or fallbacks of having a legal team? Yep, so I I, I would definitely say it's important to have access to uh, the right legal resource uh, and I do recognize that practically speaking if you're a startup there's three of you you probably don't have money, you know, or, or funds to, to hire like a lawyer. That could be quite expensive. Um, so I, I don't necessarily think that uh, if your startup scale is super small that you necessarily need to hire an in-house lawyer, um, but then you definitely um, need to engage an uh, external law firm um, to, to assist you on, you know, the legal needs that your business encounters. Uh, but one thing I would say uh, when engaging an external uh, uh, law firm is that uh, you need to be like you, you need to be upfront and really tell um, the law firm like the, your entire business model and the like so that the law firm can anticipate the legal issues on your behalf and then advise you accordingly because obviously uh, an in-house counsel who is deep in the business with you could preempt issues which outside counsel wouldn't know if they are not deep in your business. So I would say that's probably the key um, difference. But I would imagine that at the beginning stage of a startup, you're really just getting the basics started, like you know my standard customer agreement, my privacy notice, my founders agreement, shareholders agreement, and those I think an outside counsel should be able to assist um, quite well. Thank you so much. And interestingly, um, so I'm going to jump to Ryan right now. Yeah, so I know you are kind of like an external advisory, right? So I think what Samantha said that, um, you know, she said, oh, you can always uh, find an external advisory to really help with um, your startup legal processes. I think um, maybe you can share more on like kind of why is this a viable solution for guess, young startups? And when do you feel that is the best time for an external advisory to come in to help the startup with their whole legal process? Okay. Um... I do external advisory, but not exactly on legal things. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> uh, we, we do partner up with law firms to provide the, the whole range of services. I would say that external advisory is good in a sense that in usually external advisors, right, they are professionals in their fields and they see quite a wide range of startups. So whatever you bring to them usually is not new. So they, they are usually able to quickly jump on board and quickly resolve your problems for you. That's one benefit of using an external advisor. Like for us, you know, we serve 
clients from the aerospace industry all the way to retail, uh, coffee shops, you know, right across the whole spectrum, la, like even uh, beauty, pharmaceuticals, things like that. So, but of course, having an in-house legal counsel means that, you know, they really know the, the intimate details of your business. But I would say the one thing, uh, like what Samantha mentioned, don't blindside your external advisors. Don't just because they are external, you say that, uh, what, this is P and C, I'm not going to share it with you, things like that. It can end up blindsiding them quite, quite badly. And they will give you the wrong advice, which you will then take, and then you run with it, and everything, you know, goes to hell after that. Mm -hmm. So I, I would definitely say that using an external advisor has its very strong benefits, but don't blindside them. So treat them as though they are in-house because anyway, for external advisory, uh, if you're talking about legal and everything, you are protected by the law. Mm -hmm. You know, your lawyer cannot take your idea and then say, hey, I'm going to open another startup tomorrow. It's exactly the same as yours. You know, your accountant cannot do the same thing. Your cop sec is also, you know, you, they cannot do the same thing. So don't blindside them. Share with them uh, your ideas. And of course, for founders also, get yourself educated on the matter. So like if your lawyer tells you like, oh, according to, you know, certain acts, Payment Services Act, Employment Act, download the act and read it. It's free on uh, SSO AGC. You can download it from the uh, Attorney General's Chambers. So read it, get an understanding so that you can discuss further with your lawyer. Thank you, Ryan. And very quickly, a, a question just came in for you. Uh, and it asked from Matthew, by default, already protected by the law or we still require an NDA? I'm guessing that's uh, with regards to your lawyer and your accountant and all those kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, you can still do an NDA. Most, I, I would think most lawyers and accountants will sign an NDA with you. But it is by default already protected by the law. So uh, basically, it's the, the client privilege, lah, right? Mm. Uh, the only time they can reveal uh, whatever you told them is if you are involved in a criminal proceeding and they are subpoenaed and they have no choice. You know, like so some of our clients, you know, they, they get subpoenaed and then we just have to tell them, you know, I'm sorry, I, I will have to release your information to the court. So that, that is just the way it works. Mm. But yeah, definitely there is a certain level of natural protection already if the person who you are dealing with is a licensed professional and practitioner. Thank you. Um, and I guess just moving for, from more, I guess, young startups to, I guess, more developed startups in a sense. So, um, Anissa, you saw Lazada. I think you mentioned also a, a little bit earlier, you saw Lazada literally grow, you know, into what is now a beautiful unicorn. And we all know we all shop on Lazada, right? So, I guess... As you saw the company grow, how did the legal team kind of adapt to the different changes? What are the type of processes you had to, you know, put in place, I guess? Yeah. And what are the thought processes behind that? Okay. I think the most important thing that um, the legal team learned was to always stay close to the business. Um, that's the only way where you can provide very valuable advice. Uh, that's the only way they will also kind of like look at you um, in a more friendlier way rather than thinking that, oh, I shouldn't go to legal because they're going to say no. <laughs> but um, showing them that, you know, you care about the business, that you know about the business, you want to know about business update, um, sticking close to them to find out what new initiatives are they working on and, um, you know, providing your legal thoughts here and there is what gives the business, um, the commercial people or the other, you know, departments within the company um, some trust in you and then they will want to approach you and keep you, um, you know, updated. And only then are you able to also know what is the company's vision, um, what's their vision for the next uh, six months, for the next two years, uh, five years, so you know where's the direction. And by sticking, sticking close to the business, I feel that's when, um, you know, you can also like help the business grow. Yeah, so I think um, that was uh, one thing that we were told. And to also... Um, keep updated with the laws. Um, we are always attending, you know, any free or paid trainings out there, uh, any talks conducted by um, external law firms. Um, we also uh, maintain close relationships with regulators um, to sort of like keep us updated on the developments. Yeah. 
Thank you. And there was a question. Um, it was quite early on, I think, when you first mentioned that you were from Lazada. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody asked how e-commerce tackles copyright issues, i.e. people deciding to sell products with copyrighted designs that don't belong to them. Um, I, I'm not sure if you have a place to um, answer this, but if you could. Sure. So um, I think how Lazada tackles um, IP issues back then and now, it's um, very different. Uh, I think right now we are thankful that we are a subsidiary of Alibaba who has, you know, all the fancy tools in place um, to make, uh, you know, um, all these sort of processes a lot easier. So we actually have like an intellectual property platform right now where rights owners can just, you know, uh, make complaints. But back then it was more of a manual way, but it was equally important to... Um, address any copyrighted issues because the laws in Singapore are slightly, um, you know, a bit strict as long as you have reasonable knowledge that um, something is, um, you know, an infringement, you have the duty to take it down and, um, yeah, and not participate in that. So um, in the manual ways, we just make sure that we never uh, miss out any complaints brought into us. We treat every complaint very seriously and we give effect to, you know, the rights owners, um, ownership of intellectual property. Thank you so much, Anissa. Yeah. And on 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 the on the topic of kind of like copyright and all these kind of things, um, Josh, I'm moving to you. Um, you were the previous legal counsel of I understand Secret Lab, if I'm not wrong. And you know, everyone knows Secret Lab as that chair that you see it always comes out on my ads. And yes, he's sitting on a Secret Lab chair now, which I wish I had one, but I don't. But anyways, yeah. So I guess it's a little bit different for a product based or like a based startup or business. And I think this whole idea of, you know, um, applying for a patent has always been very interesting but at the same time very mysterious for some people and they don't really know how to go about it um if you don't mind if you could just walk us through like um the steps needed for someone to apply for a patent how long it takes and just a very broad based understanding of it yeah um i, I think the the very broadly okay because patterns can be quite uh, uh, um, intricate uh, in nature right um, one of the first things to do is first understand whether you actually have something that's patentable, right? And then after, uh, you, you have to understand that patents actually take years before, before you can get a patent. And how people try to protect them, and, and that's why you would need advice from a patent lawyer. Uh, there are ways to make certain applications early on, and then later take just to lock in the date, because the date that you, you file something related to a patent makes a very huge difference as to whether you get that patent uh, in your name or not, uh, as, as opposed to somebody who might be uh, doing something similar, whether it's a ripoff or not, right? Um, something that is very important, and I think, um, I'm not sure whether um, um, people will know this offhand, but you once you're in the, the uh, whatever design or whatever uh, you want to patent is out there uh, in the public, you lose your ability to patent that, um, that that design or whatever um, um, a unique novel uh, idea that you have, uh, not idea, but rather um, uh, whatever you have constructed, right? So it's very important that once you feel that you have something unique, immediately try to reach out to IP lawyers, okay? IP lawyers in Singapore, they understand that the patent uh, process is long, it's expensive, but you, it's not as if you have to pay everything up front. It's all staged, right? And it can be suited according to what you need. So just remember not to, to keep, if anything you think is novel enough, keep it confidential. Make sure that wh whoever sees it is bound by confidentiality. Make sure it doesn't reach the public in some way or another. And immediately reach out to a patent lawyer. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope that provided everyone here a bit curious about the patent process, a little bit of a broad-based understanding and I will be we have a, like a, about five minutes ish left um, I will move to some of the questions in the Q&A um, I'll just get the really quick um, questions out of the way um, first of all is digital signature on the PDF documents legally valid and binding under the Singapore law um, anyone can just shout out the answer here Short yes answer. <laughs> Short answer wow. yes all righty we got that down um, we're going to be using it here uh, it, it will be binding so I, I, but of course there are some intricacies but i don't think we have the time to go through that 
what the short yeah. answer is, yes. All right, yeah, you can always reach out to them if you want more <laughs> legal counseling. <laughs> yeah. Um, somebody else asked, what do you think about making references to sample contracts and agreements found online and modifying them slightly to suit your business? I think, Ryan, you talked a little bit about that just now in terms of, you know, what type of documents you can find. Um, yeah, so any any other thoughts about this besides what you mentioned earlier? Uh, yeah, I would say that when you modify it, uh, do double check all the terms, uh, take out the placeholders, otherwise you will look a bit uh, silly. So in, in my younger days, sometimes I left some placeholders in. Uh, yeah, and, and, and it makes you look a bit weird. Uh, but overall, I would say that definitely you can do that. And it's a good idea to do it if you cannot hire a lawyer. But if you can, then try not to scream on hiring a lawyer. Uh, because really, Nowadays, there are a lot of lawyers who are doing uh, contract vetting and editing for very good fees. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, one more question. Uh, what are some of the documentations that most startups easily miss out on along the way that could cost them? And uh, Samantha, would you like to take this question? Mm, I would say... Um... A valid contract with third parties that you have uh, relationships with. And I think um, uh, Anissa talked earlier a bit about, you know, uh, vendor contracts, uh, putting in place a necessary uh, agreement with your employees, um, with your partners or anyone that you collaborate with, especially if you plan to develop certain IP together, definitely have documentation in place uh, to deal with um, who owns the IP and, and avoid joint ownership of IP uh, unless you get advice from an IP lawyer. Thank you so much. Uh, so I think that will be honestly our last question. Just to close off this panel, thank you so much once again. Um, just going around the whole panel, what is one piece of advice you would provide to all these potential founders or startups? Yes, maybe we could go from Anissa then uh, on my screen up. So Anissa, Joshua, Ryan, then Samantha. Yes. <laughs> so just one, right? Um, yeah. I would say... I, if I had to pick, there's so many, but I think an NDA is really important, um, especially if you are at the startup phase. Um, you want to make sure that all your initial ideas and um, everything is protected. And um, yeah, so spend that cash on getting a good NDA template. And that's the document that you can use to protect your ideas. Yeah. Thank you, Anissa. Joshua, yourself? Yeah, um, for me, I, what I want, uh, I'm hoping people will take away is it's important to talk to other founders especially more experienced founders. Um, they will be able to tell you their experiences from uh, the legal perspective even, and of course other things. But um, I think that nothing hits home harder than somebody telling you from their personal experience um, something you know that they experienced as to why uh, the legal aspects of a startup are important, um, especially if somebody has actually gone through some sort of a dispute or some sort of um, regulatory hurdle, right? Uh, they will be the best people to put things in perspective for you and help you feel more comfortable to reach out to external counsel. Thank you, Joshua. Ryan, yourself? Uh, I would say corporate secretarial uh, documentation. So a lot of people miss out on the director's resolutions, the shareholders' resolutions and things like that as they grow. And I mean, even there are companies who transfer shares without any documentation at all. And that creates a lot of problems for fundraising in the future. And it's a very big hamper when, you know, someone has agreed to put $5 million in your company and then you can't unlock the money because you just failed your, your due diligence. So yeah, I would say that, that that for me would be one of the things I want them to take away. Thank you, Ryan. Samantha? Um, I would say um, as a practice, measure if if you don't have a lot of resources to engage you know a, a, a lawyer to help you on a full-time basis then um, take an interest um, 
try and learn about the landscape. Like I've seen a lot of business uh, people who would go and do like a diploma in law just so that he or she understands, you know, the kind of the legal issues that you would encounter during the course of your business. Subscribe to law firm publications because they update you, give you a summary of what the law says and, and give you updates on developments in the law. So that's super important. And whatever templates you get from the internet, get it from like a government authority like PDPC, IPOS, um, or from a law firm. D don't get it from dodgy websites. <laughs> <laughs> Great way to end this panel. Thank you guys so much. If, um, if speakers, you could just, uh, if you could stay on for a bit, um, there are, I think, uh, two more questions in there. One for Anissa and one just a general question. I'm not sure if you guys have experience with social enterprises. You guys can just type your answer back. Um, I'm sorry we don't have time to cover those questions, but please, I think our speakers are really open for you guys. If you want to reach out to them on LinkedIn, please remember to reach out professionally as well as respectfully if you have any other questions or if you'd just like to connect with them. Thank you so much again, speakers, and I will catch up with you guys um, over email and stuff. Yes. Thank you and have a great weekend, speakers. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, moving on to our next part of this webinar, we are jumping straight into a fireside chat, How to Fundraise by Koji Takahashi, Managing Partner of Edulab Capitals. This panel will be moderated by Valerie from AWS, as you can see her face right now. She's here and Koji is here as well. All right, I'll just pass it on to you, Valerie. Okay, yes, let's go. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Um, so here we have is Koji Takahashi from EduLab. And um, Koji, would you like to introduce yourself first? Sure. Can you hear me OK? Yep, I can hear you. OK, great. Yes, yeah, so hello, everyone. Uh, very nice to be here. Uh, my name is Koji Takahashi. I'm a managing partner of uh, EduLab Capital Partners, which is the venture capital arm of EduLab Group, which is the one of the leading online uh, education companies in Asia. And as a group, we have invested in more than like 20, 25 companies, including the uh, uh, regions of Southeast Asia, uh, India, China, US, and Israel. And uh, we focus on, we are typical like a seed stage fund. Uh, we, so we focus on like companies at early stage, uh, early stage, and our ticket size typically is around uh, uh, 300K to 1 mil. So as you can see, um, Koji really has a lot of experience in that field. So before we begin our official panel, um, we'd like to say that, you know, for any questions that you have, you can place it in the Q&A, not in the chat box, so that, you know, we can look at it quite simply. So Koji, can I ask you um, if you can share what are the different types of investors, you know, sources of investment that are out there? Uh, sure, sure. So we can start with the, you know, the first type of investor you reach out to when you start a company is a family and friends, right? So they are the always a uh, you know most reliable uh, source of a fund when you start a company. So you know I I myself reach out to uh, Big Brother when I started my business or, uh, early in my life. So uh, he was kind enough to uh, uh, you know uh, lend me some money, and uh, so these actually family and friends. I think they're typically provided by in the form of loan. Or can be an equity, but there is actually you know most uh, friendly friendly type of investor, and we also have a at the pre pre seed level we also have a angels. So angels can be someone who's a very uh, successful entrepreneur who took the company to IPO and so on, who is doing this actually more from a philanthropic point of view to help out the startup community, or it can be someone who can be a purely business driven investor but uh, who's willing to take a uh, risk at the early stage company. So those are the type of investors. And uh, there are also like, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to institutional investors, we have uh, something called accelerators as everyone know. And of course it's a good example is uh, AWS at start. And uh, when it comes to edtech space in Singapore, we have something, uh, you know, we, as you uh, might know already, but the edge space there in Singapore, Beyond uh, Southeast Asia, we have uh, you know global players like Y Combinators, 500 Startup, Plug and Play. Well, there are a lot of like accelerators available, and then there are uh, there are very different in, in uh, types as well. Some of them are independent, some of them are corporate accelerators, and uh, some takes equity, some they, uh, some don't. And uh, so basically, there these are the accelerators. What they will do is actually they help you at the, in every aspect of business at the early stage of uh, of your company life. 
And then we have a VC. A VC can come in at the uh, seed level, but they, you know, I mean, including our fund, actually, we actually are most active in seed. And then uh, they, you know, but many VCs are uh, most active, you know, after pre-series uh, pre A or series A. So those are the very uh, typical type of uh, investors. Wow. So that's really a lot of different kinds of investors out there. And for like beginners, like new startups, they might get a little bit confused on, you know, how they can acquire more funding. So uh, as you mentioned, like there's this thing called the seeding funding and also the series A, B and C. So could you share more about the different series of funding and how long would all these series take? Uh, sure, sure. So I can start with the C level. So C level, I mean, so maybe I can put it in the, in terms of uh, how long, maybe I can put it in, uh, paraphrase it, uh, in terms of the, you know, where the companies are in terms of the business status, I mean, business, uh, you know, uh, establishment. So the, the, again, seed is actually the uh, phase where this is the very first institutional money you'll be raising, any companies raising typically. So this is actually mainly you'll be using this actually uh, this fund for the typically for product development and of course some of the like uh, initial phase of sales and marketing so that's uh, that's the C and then typically in the US I think it's a typically it's a somewhere around the value I mean ticket size typically half mil to uh, maybe two to three mil and then you have a next stage like a series A and series A and uh, there's a de different actually definition by everyone right so I'm just saying this actually uh you know i mean from my point of view i mean we always disagree you know when it comes to the definition of series a blah blah so series a it's uh, maybe uh you know this is where uh startup you know have some kind of uh, any traction and uh, so in terms of any kpi you have once you so for example what are the kpis it can be a number of users can be a traffic can be the revenue if you can show the investor any kind of kpis and i think you're ready for the series a and uh, then next you have a series B. Series B, uh, a lot of people define this as like, you know, the stage where the company has proven their uh, product market fit. So this is a stage where once you're putting additional money, you know, pretty much you have, a, you know, you're able to scale up the, you know, uh, revenue size at the higher certainty. Now, I think I'm a believer of like a series A being, uh, being actually the stage where the PMF is uh, pretty actually proven. But uh, other people, many other people define this way. And, uh, you know, of course, at this stage, like, you know, you're starting rev uh, generating, uh, you know, uh, some, I mean, good uh, amount of revenue. And then series C and beyond that, it's anything beyond that. So, uh, you know, it's uh, you're doing pretty successfully. And then you're actually raising funds, you know, in the eyes of uh, potential IPOs on the next, I mean, sometime uh, in the future or acquisition in mind. I see. So that really gives our audience, you know, a brief understanding of what is the difference between A, B, and C, and they can plan their timeline on when to acquire what kind of funding, right? So I think the next question that we have here is, um, when should a startup begin the fundraising process, and when do they know if they are ready for fundraising? Yes, I think uh, to, to answer, my version of answer is anytime, now. So when you have a uh, when you have a business idea, now you should have a you should get ready for the fundraising. I uh, think it's a always good idea wherever the you know stage of your company. I think you should be ready for fundraising because uh, it really helps to have. Uh, I think I spoke with some entrepreneurs actually in the last week, and I think it uh, seems to help to uh, it seems to help to have uh, two things actually all the time. One is actually pitch book. I mean, of course, I mean, this is a regal of the face. So I think if you're talking to VC, you typically have a pitch book. But even at the, when you're just starting a business, I mean, just you have just had a business idea, it's good to have a pitch book. I mean, at, uh, at, uh, as much as possible. I mean, of course, financial forecast is actually, you know, all the, uh, it's not going to be accurate, but I think it's always have a, uh, good to have a pitch book. And then uh, it's all, and the second thing is actually always good to have, a, you know, preparation for elevator pitch, a 30 seconds, one minute, actually, uh, you know, you'll be able to actually, you know, articulate, you know, what your companies are and what you're trying to achieve. So to did I answer to your question, I think it's a, I think I, it, whenever you are, I mean, when we're, you're doing business, I think you should be ready for fundraising. 
So you mentioned about the pitch book. Um, how can we pitch well enough to convince our investors? Like, what are the necessary few things you know that we should include in our pitch book? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah. So you can go online and actually check all these. There are a lot of templates available, but I think it's actually they're quite good actually. So I think you can have like you know typically. I think first and foremost, actually, you need to define the problem you're trying to solve. And then you need to talk about the solutions you're providing, right? The, what kind of solution, what kind of value proposition you're uh, offering to the world to solve the problem. And then this actually involves with the, uh, you know, your description of your product and how it is, how it's unique and so on. And then for the, especially from VC's point of view for, I mean, VCs are always looking for like, you know, for their investment to become actually multiply. So of course, address size of the market is very important. I mean, so is it scalable enough? And uh, you can have a competitive landscape typically come with the, you know, with the, you know, the competitive benchmark with a with matrix, you know, I mean, the type of page you have seen. And, uh, you know, of course, management team. And if you're at, uh, you know, the stage, uh, you know, uh, good enough with this like, uh, financial forecast and of course, uh, you know, detail of the valuation and uh, scheme. I think those are the must have. And you can add, of course, other things, but I think those are the things that you should have uh, uh, at least. Mm. Yes, I also agree that, you know, we must have all the market sizing and our value proposition, like all these kind of things must be defined very clearly so that the investors know what are they investing in, right? So um, just now you mentioned that, you know, elevator pitch is also very important to prepare. Um, do you have any examples of your successful um, elevator pitch and like how could you like share a story about that? Elevator pitch. I haven't encountered actually elevator pitch having said that, but I always hear about the, you know, the you know, example of, a, you know, a elevator pitch actually led to the actual fundraising. But I think it's uh, they need to include actually the problem and the problem they're trying to solve and the solution. I think those are the most the two important uh, you know, element. All right, so um, we have a question from the floor. Um, the speaker mentioned that a company is ready for Series A when they can show investors some form of KPI. Do you mean that the company is ready for Series A once the company has hit a certain KPI set by the company itself? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think so. I'm, not, I'm trying to understand the question. So you need to show the you know uh, relevant KPIs, and then so if you have a, I think the bottom line is if you can have the gen start gen if you already have a traction in terms of revenue, I think that's always better. But even without it, a lot of investors invest actually, uh, you know, for if you have a you know uh, convincing KPI, for example, number of uh, you know you have so many like uh, you know uh, online, I mean, no, I mean free users on on your platform. Let's say this is a B two C platform. And then you actually haven't proven the monetization part, but I think, hey, but this is actually, you know, can be very attractive Series A investment. So, so that that kind of a, you know, uh, achievement is necessary. So, I think the answer, I mean, the kind of a question. Yeah, asked, I think it kind of answers the question. Well, we answer my question. If if I haven't, please uh, type in again. Sure, sure. So um, for the participant who asked this question, if you still need any clarifications, you know, feel free to type in the Q&A. So another participant actually asked, uh, what is a good way to get in contact with more VCs or business angels? Because, you know, sometimes it's very hard to actually get yeah. encounter with all these kind of um, very um, important people. Yeah. Sure, sure. I think the best way is actually always referral. So if you know, like if you have like, you know, uh, comrade, your comrade, you know, your uh, other entrepreneur friends, actually like your partners, I think they're all, and they, who actually knows a, a institution investor, that's always the best actually approach. And then actually, so because VCs typically receive a lot of cold calls and they actually receive so many pitch books and it's not very intentional, including mine actually. So it's not, it, typically VC, you mean capitalists, I mean, they don't have a time to reply simply because they're dealing with so many uh, you know, uh, such a high volume, it, it doesn't mean they don't intend to reply, right? But uh, what I mean is actually, so uh, the best is always through referral, worst is actually through cold mail. 
Yes, and I also agree on that. You know, this is a very good opportunity to actually get connected with all our families and even Koji right here because you never know uh, when an opportunity can come knocking on your door. Right? Uh, yeah, so, so so if you don't have any immediate contact, I think it's a you know, event like this or like, you know, uh, I mean, when the COVID actually settles down, I mean, any kind of uh, online or offline event, actually, you know, like, uh, for example, hosted by AWS Esther or any other, you know, uh, platform, I think that's a very good one because you can reach out to VCs and then you can just casually talk to, hey, what's up, right? So that's always easier. Yep, yep. So always, you know, keep your network open and just feel free to ask for anyone for advice. Like, yeah, you know, just reach out. You never know what can happen. So another question for you, Koji, is do you need to give um, your investors any equity? Like, for example, what is a good uh, fund to equity percentage ratio? Uh, okay, so I think to answer to that question, not necessarily, although many, I mean, majority, I mean, mainstream is actually you give away the equity. So speaking about the, you know, the equity ratio, so my answer would be always uh, as small as possible, of course, right? Because I mean, it's kind of what kind of answer is that, but it is true because you shouldn't give up your equity. I mean, so easily, especially if you're early stage. So seed level, typically I think, uh, so some accelerator, you know, uh, you know, platform, they actually typically take up to 10%, uh, you know, I mean, or more or less. And uh, so let's say in the seed level, typically 10% up, up to 20%, depending on the amount, right? And then uh, series A, series B, I mean, series A, series B, maybe like a 20% typically. And series B, a series B dot, I mean, B plus series C become even like one third of the you know, whole equity stuff like that. But I think it's, you need to come up with the, actually your business plan. It, of course, it never goes according to the business plan, you, but you should always have a business plan and a cap, um, cap table actually forecast to actually manage this. Mm, right, right. So um, what are the some signs that the investors lose interest in funding our project and how long should you know they wait if they don't hear from the investors? Like, should they um, follow up very regularly or... You know, what are some advice that you can give it to them? So is this typically like uh, once you talk to investor or are you just uh, reaching an uh, investor for the first time? Um, if you are reaching out to the investors for the first time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so without having, having met them yet. Yeah, so that, that's, that depends actually. So but typically the conversion rate, I mean, so reply, response rate is actually very low if you haven't met them, you know, I mean, without the referral. But I think uh, you can, I would say you can try maybe at least a couple of times that if not, maybe my, you might not have a high chance. And I, 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 if I were an entrepreneur, I would move on. I mean, it's, it's my, my point of view personally, but I think that's, uh, if I receive an email maybe twice, I think if I don't reply, maybe, you know, even I'm sure if, we, if I receive twice, of course, I, I would have gone through the pitch book at least, right? If you send them, but uh, if, if they don't reply to you, maybe, not much high chance, or maybe they busy, uh, they're uh, a little bit way too busy. So maybe you can apply, I mean, reply, maybe we give them like a, up to one month. There is no right answer. Well, one month is a bit long, especially, long, you know, long. for yeah, the yeah. person waiting for yeah. the funding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe two weeks, but, uh, mm. I, I would, yeah, but I think that's a cap. I think, yeah, you shouldn't go more than that. Mm, so if like an investor doesn't show interest, they should, you know, keep their options open and just pursue other investors as well concurrently, right? Yes, I think it's just the waiting time. If I think it's, uh, if I don't hear from them like uh, within a week, right? So I think that already chance is lower. Maybe there might be a slight chance like after one, beyond one week. So I think, uh, you know, again, so to your previous question, I think that channel is always more, I mean, most important. You know, like how do you approach uh, approach them? Referrals is like key, right? right. Or, or maybe like uh, there are many types of investors, right? But if you're part of the, you know, any accelerator program, accelerators have typically have a many, uh, you know, partners, right? So that's always very smooth, right? I mean, because VC typically won't say no to accelerators because, uh, especially if you're like uh, early stage VCs, like uh, like we, right? So we actually work very closely with accelerator people. 
So we try to invest in like, you know, whoever the, you know, best, some of the best performers of the accelerators. So of course we, you know, we, we, we want to be always supporting to them because it's actually mutual like a relationship. So you always try to utilize kind of accelerators if you're always teaching. Mm, interesting. We also have accelerators, you know, in my school. Uh, there's this thing called the SMU IIE. So it's the Institute of Innovation and Entrepreneurship where, you know, student projects can get a chance for funding as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think all these opportunities really, you know, help startups, you know, get connected to the different investors out there. Mm -hmm. right, so Koji, can I ask you, um, how can startup gauge what is a good investment to accept and uh, when should they walk away from an investment offer? Uh, so I'm sorry, what was the first one? Uh, what, is, what, what makes a good investor? Yes, what is a good investment uh, to accept? Okay. Yes, okay. So <laughs> this is like a very philosophical question too, but in practice, I always think it's actually, good investor should bring in uh, anything Okay, I'll give you two maybe. So first one is actually obviously from technical point of view, investors should bring in anything more, I mean, value added services, uh, you know, beyond cash, right? So not only bringing money, cash as an investment, they should be able to support you uh, to grow, build your business for any, from any type of, uh, you know, uh, aspect. It can be, let's say, product development, technical side, you know, I mean, bringing like an AI machine learning expert, or the you know supporting in terms of sales and marketing and of course fundraising. So I mean, no VCs are all rounder. I mean, they might not be able to do it all, but I think uh, you should choose an investor who can bring in like you know what what you actually need the most at least. And the second one is I think this is the most important from my point of view is a good investor depends on like uh, to depend on who who you are and what kind of company you are. Good invest the definition of a good investor bit depends on like you know the stage of the company and also uh, the type of the management. I mean your personality too. So uh, I would always say, can you be a good friend with this? Can, can do you see investor as a good friend or not? Do you have a good chemistry with with the you know with him or her on the personal level? I think that at the end of the day, that's the most important actually criteria I would say because actually because it's a very long process. It's not it's not a marriage. But maybe as close to that, because like you'll be, be working with, uh, you know, um, institutional investors, maybe possibly like beyond five years, 10 years. I mean, 10 years can be, uh, you know, but it's possible, right? So, yeah, so I think I would always actually put the, you know, personal actually fit as a, you know, uh, highest priority. Wow, that's really some interesting uh, sharing and I really learned quite a lot also. Um, so there's one question from the floor. Uh, when should they stop a funding round? Example, uh, judging by the amount raised or is there like a fixed time period, you know, to stop the funding? Stop the funding? I'm sorry, what do you mean? I think what the participant means is that um, how do they know that they have come to the end of this particular funding round? Okay, so so again, so that you should figure out based on your business plan and how much fund funding you require for each round. So of course you wouldn't go like you know you don't you wouldn't go with the flow when you do fundraising. You need to have always solid business plan. I mean, other investors can can say anything else, but I personally believe you should always have a very solid business plan, regardless if it's going to work out or not. And then like you know, let's say. You might be want you might be want want to uh, you might want to raise more money, but uh, if you dilute uh, you know your your equity too much, I think that's not a good fundraising. So you should always have a you know a very overall picture of like it what what you're trying to achieve throughout your company life, and then you actually I mean you have a business plan always come first, then funding, funding never come in first. So you should have a business plan first. How, what you want to achieve in a, you know in a certain time in a year two three years and so like that and then based on that actually you uh you can then then you'll have exactly clear idea how much you need to raise and how much you can you can uh, allow uh, dilution. Great, great. I think that ties in, you know, to the last question where a participant asked, can there be ever too much funding? Because each time, you know, they fund, they might lose some equity. Then as you mentioned, you know, we really need to gauge what is the company's needs instead of like overfeeding equity, which might not be necessary for the company. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I've seen a case where like a fundraiser entrepreneur gets so excited about the, you know, a uh, lot of traction and that he gave a, I mean, he raised maybe I think like 20 mil. 
I mean, at, but at, he did this actually at the, when he's actually at uh, pre-series A. And then uh, he diluted so much. And then actually later on, he actually, his portion was very single digit. So that's a typical mistake, right? Yes, yes, that is. So it's really very important to know what is your business needs. Well, thank you so much, Koji, you know, for being with us here today. I believe there are some more questions in the Q&A chat, but unfortunately, we are running slightly out of time. So, you know, feel free to stay back and answer any questions that are left in the Q&A channel. And really, thank you so much for sharing with us your knowledge. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much, Koji. Thank you. Thank you so much, Koji Ken. And um, a reminder, if you guys want to continue reaching out to him, and you know, you can just reach out to him via LinkedIn. But as always, reach out respectfully as well as professionally. And with that, we are now jumping into our break. So please be back by 4.30 p.m. We'll start pretty much on the dot and upcoming with our company culture panel. Um, it's really exciting. Um, you will realize how important company culture is to building a startup. So yes, come back then. Um, in the meantime, um, you if you haven't registered for your AWS Educate account, please head to the link or you can scan the QR code right now on um, the slide itself um, to sign up for your AWS Educate account and um, yeah if you have any other questions about the AWS Educate platform or this bootcamp you can just leave them into the Q&A and our team will take this time to answer them and get back to you um, if not I'll see you at 4 30.
Yeah, I will ask whether you are low.
everyone. We'll be starting in about five minutes or so. So if you can get back to your devices by then, that will be great. I will see you guys in a bit. All right, when we are back. Um, yes, so just jumping straight into our next panel on company culture. I'll just like to very shortly introduce our speakers for today. We have Dennis, the founder of Legazzi, an investor at Eat Launchpad, as well as Grace Sai, CEO and co-founder of Foundate Innovation. And yes, they are both here right now. And moderating this panel will be Valerie again from AWS. So yes, Valerie, over to you. Hi, Daniels. Hi, Grace. Um, before we begin our panel, just a gentle reminder to our participants, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to leave your questions in a QA and a so that it's easier for us to look at the questions and answer them. All right, so without further ado, Dennis and Grace, could you uh, take turns to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, Grace, do you want to go first? Go for it. Okay. Um, so, hi everyone. I'm, I'm Dennis. So, I'm the founder of Legacy. I'm also invested in eLaunchpad, uh, which is, uh, so Legacy is actually a corporate service firm where we provide like, um, um, you know, basically a corporate compliance, accounting, 
and also uh, startup advisory. Like uh, we have quite a bit of startups uh, going from from like uh, angel round sort to like series A or full series A really. Um, and then basically we have offices across uh, a few emerging market countries also like Vietnam. Uh, we are looking at setting up in uh, Myanmar soon and uh, basically headquartered in Singapore, you know. And then as for it, like, you know, uh, why I got into it is because like it launched Pet. The, the thing about it is like, a, it's a tech company. I always wanted to, you know, run a tech, tech company also. So, so uh, coming as an investor, right, um, really is more towards like um, to understand also, to see how I can help the, the co-founders to build up their, their business, like, you know. So yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. Over to you, Grace. Hi everyone, great to see around 70 plus of you here. Um, I'm Grace, I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Founding Innovation. We are an innovation consult, corporate innovation agency, but that also has co-working um, campuses. Um, I'm personally also a venture capitalist um, leading an early stage tech fund that invests in early stage tech ventures. And um, apart from that, I'm also a mom to a, to a 15 month old girl and an ecosystem builder and has been part of Singapore startup ecosystem since 2012. It's so great to have Denise and Grace with us here today. So um, without further ado, uh, Grace, would you like to share more about, you know, what is company culture and your perspective followed by Denise? Sure. So um, company culture, I mean, I won't give you the, the literature, you know, definition, but um, it is the unspoken norm, right? It is the unspoken leader of how one um, decides, what one decides when you have competing um, choices or commitments, for example. So the culture of the company would propel you to choose decision A over decision B. And especially when these decisions are very nuanced, they are competing in nature and you are conflicted. So a good culture will make the decision quite clear. Um, and this could be small decisions, it could be big decisions, um, including, you know, how we speak to each other and um, what we wear, but also bigger things like, do we make this ethical decision or do we have this type of customer or when do we pay our suppliers and how do we treat partners, things like that. So it's the invisible leader, I feel. Wow, that's, that's great. Um, well, for me, is that, you know, when people ask me about company culture, right? It does remind me of um, this graphic I've ever seen before. It's like people ask about what's branding, right? So in that sense, company culture is, to me, is similar to branding in the sense. It's like, um, you know, it's some, some form of like a gut feeling. When you work for some, like when you work in the, in, in the company and stuff, right? What is that gut feeling you have? Uh, that, that's very similar to what's branding like, in that sense also, right? The gut feeling that you have when you work in the company, what you can do, then what's the gut feeling you have from that, you know? So it's like, it's like an instinct. And similarly to what Grace said, um, it's not tangible. It's not something you set as a rule. It's unspoken, yes. And that's why it's very much also, is it a, is it a gut thing? It's not really a brain thing like that. You know, is it logical? Sometimes it may not be logical from different people's perspective, right? So I, I think I did like to draw it that way, yeah. It's more like a gut feeling thing, right? But it's also an accumulation of many things, uh, many small decisions, like you know, Grace say also, like really bringing together. And then that makes that, you know, that makes that, that, that culture in there, right? Yeah, so, yeah. All right, so with what Grace and what Benny said, right? So company culture is really about competing choices and having the gut feeling, you know, to make the right decision. So um, just wondering, like, have you all encountered like any good potential examples that you remember about like great company cultures, in, even in startups or even in like MNCs? Uh, maybe Grace can go first. Grace, I think you're muted. Uh, so when you are, it depends where you are at in life and your, your career. But um, if you're just starting out, for example, if you want to be um, an entrepreneur, I think it is um, important to find a role model um, company or, or a leader 
and try to understand the culture that she or he creates in, in, in that team. Um, if you have already worked in a company before or a few companies before, also take note of the things that you didn't like and why. And um, sometimes knowing what we don't want and sometimes knowing what we, what we think is not good is equally as important um, to guide to guide how you would think. So I won't give an easy example as to saying, oh, Netflix has a great culture because it has a, you know, a, a no take, a no leave policy culture, which means you don't have official leave. Anyone can take any leave anytime. Look, it might work in Silicon Valley in that kind of culture. It might not work here. I don't know, right? So I'm not going to give that simple sort of this company has a great culture. It, it has to work for your people. Um, at the end, they are your customers. Great. Um, so, I guess from what I've seen, um, I mean, culture as an example, like what kind of example is um, what I hear and what I see also like, is that like, uh, I, I guess outright from, from my firm, <laughs> uh, one of the culture that we have, I call it culture, uh, um, is actually food. Food is the, the thing that brings us along, right? And of course, uh, you know, I my, my my team is quite diverse, right? So at one move, I, I remember that at one time I have I have stuff that cannot eat anything than chicken, like like not even fish and stuff. Like okay, so that's why. And then you know, and then we have like hala and non hala and all this stuff, right? And then the thing is, but regardless, right? Even if it's difficult, right? But the thing is, we still bring basically we just you know still make it happen that every week. You know, like uh, every Friday, we're gonna come together, we're gonna eat, and we're gonna talk and stuff like that, right? So the thing is, like, uh, if you were to say an example, that, that 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 seems like an example of like, you know, like coming together for a certain timing for for things is is actually also one like culture that can be cultivated, right? So, but that's one. Another one was that um, actually this is also just very recent. Like this morning, I was interviewing for someone new, like um. And you know, like I was interviewing him and I was saying that, you know, um uh, uh about his stuff and then before he left and then he was saying that, you know what, uh i uh, he told me that his his current boss treat him very well and that like one of the, the things is like I asked him, Do you take leave to come for the interview? You know. Okay, I'm not gonna say name, I kinda okay, right? So the thing is do you take leave before before you come here? I say, Leave? No, I didn't take any leave. Um we all work from home, I cleared my emails and then you know I can go wherever I want. And I said, well, okay, then that means your boss trusts you a lot. And he's actually quite junior in the firm, right? It was a firm, I think it has about 20-ish people. Lah. Yeah, he has like a group of, like, of five people in his department. So, I mean, that I felt that was a very good example. Like, even if your company reaches a certain size, right, some things can be seen just by how the employee talk about, you know, that about the firm, about the practice. And then he, to him, it's, like, it's a good culture company. Right, so so the thing is flexibility also is another amazing one. Uh, you know, flexibility, uh, like an uh, example of like how culture is being made out and you know practice. Mm, I totally agree with all your points. Like personally, I also feel that you know trust and flexibility given by the boss is actually something very important that the employee will value. Uh, personally, for me, over like employee perks. Like, um, I would prefer that, you know, the boss trust in our work, you know, give us like um, good, um, like praise on the back, you know, whenever we complete something, uh, even something small. I think all this really keeps the employee's motivation uh, at a very high level. Yeah, especially in startups where, you know, everyone really has to put in the grind to get the startup up and running. Right. So I think the next question that we have is really about, um, you know, who should be the champion in the company culture, right? Is it like more of the HR role or is it like more of the uh, leader, like the CEO role? Um, would you like to share more about that, Grace? I mean, if you're a startup, you'll be lucky to have a HR department. <laughs> as, a, as a founder, you're every department, including most importantly, the culture department. So yeah, I think, um, you know, there's a Chinese saying, right? If the head is not right, the tail is not right. So uh, everything starts from the top. And the funny thing is, as entrepreneurs and as founders, we always build an extension of ourselves, no matter we like it or not, with all our good and bad, you know? 
it's very it's it's um it's unlikely that we build something that we are not initially you know so um from that perspective be very cautious actually you know spend uh, invest a lot of time and resources in being self aware because you might be um transferring uh to use a psychological term you might be transferring your own uh, baggages and insecurities and you know pet peeves and hot buttons you know to um into the company culture because like i say it's the the border between self and company in the early stages is so thin and and so unfortunately the answer is yes it starts from the the founders i don't know if that's top or bottom or middle you're everything you should be everywhere um and um but but as a result of that of the very thin uh, boundary um we have to be very self aware of what of what we are creating and what a leader we are becoming yeah and i i i think you know like what grace is really there i i don't even know what to add on to that to be honest but i remember there was this saying like uh you know like if you want to see if okay so how many like the number of people you need in a company to do certain things right it's like if you uh to build a company right to build a business right like you need five people with enough passion to build it right and then this is what here lah okay then you need 50 people and then you need system to make this business work okay and then lastly they say if you have 500 people you know what makes it work culture and it stems all the way from the top and i must say that's like totally i, I agree and it's actually that's a challenge to Uh, you know, like segregate that away from, like sometimes the temptation of like you know yourself into us the culture, but also in a sense to me that seems also be, to be a thing also that the founders um self can be actually the 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 foundation of the culture itself also right. So I think that is definitely um I thought this is one of the the good things that I hear before like like uh of course the 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 people the first five usually are like the founders or the Key, like the key, you know, leaders in the company, right? When with the passion, it really sort of creates a certain passion down the, a uh, certain culture down the road, right? So that stems out like like that, you know. Um, of course, um, who to champion it? Like, uh, I I must say, it launchpad is lucky enough that it has a uh, HR, <laughs> but the HR is also at the same time operation, lah. So double row, right? So the thing is that, um. That's still very much needed, to be honest. Like because the thing is that once you come to a size, like say, um, like like if you come to coming to ten, right? The thing is like uh, checking in with everyone is definitely very important. And founders should really know what's going on also. But like um, someone to help to champion this like so far hit shot thing, right? Hit shot in the sense is more of like trying to create a system from there already. Like so take that take that guideline that say five percent. Maybe you don't need the system, but really need to push first, right? But once you come near to fifty, right? If you don't even have a system, that that's a problem. That's a problem. So the thing is that the HR actually is actually someone that draws up the frame or that you know that that framework and stuff like that to help towards managing a fifty, right? And then once more than that, then of course the system is not enough. It is like what? Why do you even like? Why why does everyone come in? What is the firm for? And all this stuff is more than system really by then. Okay. So I think that's my point. Yeah. Mm. So to summarize both Grace and Denis's point is that um you know at the very beginning the founder's role is very critical because he or she will be the role model for all the other employees but you know as the startup gets bigger and bigger then of course there's a need for a system to be in place so that you know everyone can follow the rules even even though like there needs to be some flexibility so we have a question from the floor. Um, this question is a little bit tough. It's uh, asking about how does a company measure and quantify the benefits of cultural decisions, and also decide on the amount of resources that should be allocated to building them. So it's something more about like you know how can a company decide you know what are the resources needed to allocate towards building a good culture, and I guess it's very subjective. But we'd like to hear from both Grace and Dennis on that. So I'll comment first on the. It is a loaded question. I mean, this could be a one week seminar just tackling that one question. Um, actually, I like to see who who asks that later on. But um, I would say in terms of resources, um, it is not the money part 
in the form of a resource, it is the time part that, that you, uh, one needs to put in to form um, a great culture. Um, of course, the money part met, comes in when, let's say, you know, it's part of the culture to have fun and therefore throw parties or, you know, have biannual retreats and all that. So you do need to budget for those things. But um, it is the, you know, I think uh, Valerie said that before, right? It is the small little conscious and unconscious actions and words by um, the bosses and by each other, really, that really matter the most. You know, I, I've, I've been in cultures where the most luxurious retreats and parties cannot um, supersede, you know, a hurtful word, for example, that is like not respectful and not, you know, aligned with the company culture. And that feels very much more a betrayal to, to the employees um, versus, you know, not buying them nice holidays or trips or anything like that. So I would actually focus the resources in the daily actions, the daily words, what you say and not say, what you do and not do. Um, I call it internal networking, you know. Um, you know, I think a lot of um, entrepreneurs um, often look outwards, you know, very customer-centric, always look at market trends, paranoid about competitors, networking, building, building business development leads. But sometimes we forget that external networking is important, but internal networking is even more important. You know, it's, the, it's mingling with each other, uh, with the staff and with, um, even our cleaners and all because um, that is the propeller that's the multiplier um, effect on the company on the organizational goals and that's how you can measure whether um, whether your culture is working you 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 basically look at not only the financial performance but that you know, like we have employee NPS is something we measure uh, we used to measure every two weeks right the pulse of the health of the company, you know, not just the wealth part, right? So um, if that is good, if that is um, in danger, it's fine, you know, quickly recuperate. It's never linear. It's never, it's never not untidy, you know, it's always, and it, morale is never always high, right? That's part of the journey. Um, but whether people feel that we care enough to measure how they feel um, is important. Okay, from, from me, um, well, guys, you're lucky. I'm, I, I teach financial modeling, right, to startups. So <laughs> this question about how do you measure culture creation? Well, I'm always out there to try to measure something, right? That's, that's like, uh, well, finance guys are always like thinking of like, like that, right? You, we, we have things like uh, average earning per employee, right? Because uh, that is actually one of the indicators that like uh, you can draw and compare yourself to like Apple and stuff like, are you working on the track, right track and stuff like that, right? But I mean, of course, again, like, of course, it's not talking about like how much earning you're, you're talking about and stuff like that. It's about like, um, how does it affect your company and like, you know, things like that, right? I mean, the thing is like, do you really think, like, I mean, to think about it, Quantifying benefits of culture decision. I mean, you know, the dynamic itself is the word culture also, right? Like to me, is it HR decision, you know, etc. To me, actually culture and HR can be very separate. Okay, so the thing is that like, um, but there's health signs that definitely you can see. Health signs of performance. When you see performance, uh, when someone is burning out, you know, the performance going down, like maybe even not a bit, not, not, not talking about like, uh, quantifiable like average earning stuff. I'm talking about number of hours there, like um used to be and what used not to be, right? Could be also uh red flagging. And then the thing is you try to curb that, right? So that in that sense, like if I were to really be like particular about it, and I'm seeing this in some startups, right? Is that really is to then you know go back and ask and find out that like what's going on and stuff like that with the stuff, right? And then you know like um but of course culture in that sense also is a combination of like many you know, decisions make to this point. That's why some, if, if you see a whole group of like uh, a certain department or like really burning on itself, then something is off really, right? So I, I would say for, for that, but that's more of like a visual, visible like um, impact you can see off, uh, all right from that. 
but of course you want to reset lah. So the thing is that how you test it and stuff also depends on like what you do every day and stuff and things like that, right? So um, just sharing also is like I just celebrated all my stuff birthday yesterday, right? And uh, it was just simple lunch and stuff like that. Then you know, uh, but we have a culture of gifting also, like um, like each of the staff go and buy something for her and things like that. It's just not, it's nothing to do with how expensive and stuff. The thing is. But then I know that literally the next day I'm seeing like this very high morale from her, right? And then she's like, before I even wake up, she's texting me things and she's like, you know what? This is this is this is this is just this next few. Don't uh don't worry until the end of the year Christmas, right? All settled. I'm like oh okay wow. <laughs> so the thing is that um um also it's not so easy to quantify. That's what I'm trying to say. It's a bit like forecasting also, right? There's up and there's low. Yeah, but I mean. It's really like scientists, right? So I mean, with the mindset of scientists, it's really to to, to predict patterns and then you estimate and then you test it, A B test it, lah. You know, yeah. Mm. So like what Grace and Dennis mentioned, right? Internal networking is also very important because um, besides, you know, focusing on your customers, you need to focus on your employees who are actually the ones who are speaking to your customers. Right. So as what Dennis also mentioned, you know, sometimes you can exchange gifts amongst uh, your employees or, you know, like bring them out for lunch or like, you know, organize a, a, maybe a day per week where you guys, you know, have a lunch and just, you know, chit chat and talk about um, more personal stuff instead of all the work stuff so that, you know, your staff, your employees, you know, get a balance between mix and pers- uh, work and personal so that they don't get burned out so um, quickly, right? So I think um, they covered quite a, quite deeply inside this um, topic. Um, so the next question that I have for both Grace and Denise is that, um, you know, what are some common pain points uh, faced by the startups or, or, you know, the startups that you mentored or, you know, your startup? Yeah, like what are some of the common pain points? It can be not about culture or it can be about culture as well. That's a very uh, broad, anything can be a pain <laughs> from finance to customer to people. Do you have a more specific, like what? Angle? Um, then maybe more about people. I think, yeah, I think it will suit this um, panel more. Uh, maybe some pain points that you feel about um, people management, like, you know, some patterns that you spotted whereby, you know, people are not really delivering their work or, you know, they are having some issues that, you know, you can elaborate more on that. Yeah, so um, I think it's especially challenging for first-time boss, okay, or for first-time entrepreneur because um, you are leading the team, but you're also leading yourself and you're leading, you know, sometimes a community, your customers, you have a public persona, for example. So it's many, many hats at the same time so um, the that that self sustaining not burning out I think is a is a big one right um, and um, like my personal journey like I have burned out twice before in the first three years and the first time when I burned out I didn't even know what that word was and I didn't even know what the symptoms were right like you're just go 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 you're hustling and you're building and you know, you're always fighting fires. And, um, and if, I, if I didn't have a good team who pointed out, hey, Grace, I think you're showing signs of burnout, I would not know how to pause and, and recuperate from that. So the, my first point is the entrepreneurs, the founders yourselves, ourselves need to take care of our own well-being because without that, we will not build great teams, Okay. That's the first thing. The second pain point is in the team, uh, everybody has different needs. Um, it takes a lot of time to do one-on-ones and all, but we, you know, or spending time um, building building team, right? But I would say if you look at your calendar, you know, whether it's your iCal or your Apple calendar or your Google calendar, look at how you're spending time. I would recommend that 30% of your time um, should be with your team. 
um, in a week, right? So it's a good audit to, to do, you know, how are you balancing the design of your, of your days because that determines where you spend your attention, right? Time equals attention equals everything else, right? So, um, and, um, and aligning the team, uh, team's way of spending time as well. Look at their calendars, you know, how much of their activities are really towards the top three priorities of your company in this quarter, right? Um, and um, definitely use um, frameworks and all to align, to align goals. And I would say with that, you know, with that goal orientedness and a structured approach, transparent approach to achieve goals, plus your um, attention to building a great culture, these two pairing together should, you know, should put uh, most people in a good spot. Um, well, the thing is, uh, from the startups I, I see, uh, like a mentor and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Um, actually, even before that, I mean, I, I, I look at it also at myself, like if you ask me about this or so, well, I, I did some interviews also recently, and then the, the always the same question is being asked is like, what's the problem you basic? What's the problem you, you always find as a challenge, right? And I must say, in general, it's one word, like people. Because the thing is like, for me, work easy, no problem. Work is like, to fulfill the work and stuff is structured and stuff, right? But sometimes people is not as straightforward as this. It's like it's not like deliverables. You can you know it's very hard to trust measure people as deliverables sometimes also. So the thing is, and that has something to do with this today's theme of course. Like it's actually culture is being playing a part of it, right? And then the thing is that, and this may always be the case that uh might be the 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 problem that like I mean. Basically, the challenge that you always face, even if uh, you grow the business and stuff, it's always back to people. Why? Because it's people, well, we, in general, people are complex, but I must say. And then taking the time to really understand them more and, and stuff like that, I think it's very much needed. Um, no matter what size you are at, it's really taking the time to, uh, whether it's, is it that you, you do this one-to-one, -one, or if you reach to a size that you have 100 people working with you, then you should have like the system to actually get this one-to-one -one with someone, right? It's always human. Right? It's very human to get connected. And I think that's very essential, right? So, um, yeah, but touching really on the point about like the startup, uh, that the common problem that the startup see is actually starting the, the, the first team, the first key leaders. Because essentially they are the ones that influence the, the next, the, the, I call it the next batch of like the, the employees that comes in, right? The first batch is always the most important because they are literally like the ones that like, um, uh, make sure that it goes and that they skill they're so basically they're skilling your your passion right but as as soon as they're actually the one that's skilling your culture also so if you have one down for that right like not sure or just unclear right I tell you the whole is is basically uh you know a game of cards is the whole thing will fall yeah so I think that is also one of the most common challenge I mean that is pers personally that was the challenge I'm trying to uh that, that I, I actually overcome and um, how do I do it? Really, it's really um, how I did it was really hiring and then working and then like you know um, people leave and people go until you find the right one. Sometimes it's also fi about finding the right one also like, But it is not to give up by that you know. Yeah. So uh, and of course the benefit of it is once you find someone that is like really uh, concrete right a foundation in your business like they remind you actually I I do I also have that plan now. Uh, where sometimes I even feel lost. It's not only just uh, like like really overworking, right? But lost about like why am I doing this and stuff, right? The direction of the company and stuff like that. And they actually the one that tell you that like, you know uh, this is the thing that we all work together and stuff. We remind you, you know. And life is so uh, hard to expect so, like what will happen. So you never know. Like building this actually brings you a lot of benefit also. Mm. So as Grace and Denise both, you know, they mentioned that, you know, besides taking care of your employees, you also really have to take good care of yourself as a founder because, you know, the founder can really get the burnout very easily, you know, by having so much responsibilities on your hands, you know, they have to wear so many different hats at the same time. Right, so um, before we close up this panel, um, there are some questions in a Q&A chat that uh, we might not be able to answer now, but, you know, Grace and Denise, you know, if you could, you can actually answer them uh, after this uh, panel session. Um, 
Ooh, there's quite a few. Yep, so um, because we will need to move on to the next section, um, Grace and Denise, uh, we will really appreciate if you can reply them, you know, on the question and answer uh, chat. Thank you so much, Grace and Denise, you know, for sharing with us so in-depth about the company culture today. And I believe, you know, all the attendees really learned a thing or two about how to build a great company culture. Thank you so much, Grace and Denise. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you so much again, Grace and Dennis. Uh, once again, of course, everyone here, if you'd like to reach out to the speakers, you can just reach out to them on LinkedIn. Again, respectfully as well as professionally. Thank you so much again, Grace and Dennis. Have a good weekend moving forward and I'll reach out to you guys again via email and stuff to catch up. Okay, so jumping into the very last part of our session, which I'm sure a lot of you have been asking about and you know, wondering about. So before we head to that, let's just come, go back in time a little bit and look at what we've covered. So we've covered, of, of course, the six topics in the AWS Educate Startup module, getting started as a founder, customer discovery and development, as well as building your MVP on the first day. And today we looked at legal fundamentals, how to fundraise, as well as growth strategies and culture. So tomorrow, of course, <clears throat> excuse me, there'll be the AWS Virtual Career Fair. Um, the link will be provided just in a bit. And of course, post bootcamp, we, you guys will get the exclusive Skate X AWS t-shirt and certificate if you complete the startup batch on the AWS Educate platform. And of course, here is how you can redeem your t-shirt and certificate. So you can feel free to take screenshots, photos, whatever you need, but don't worry, all this information will be sent to you via email as well. So step one, you have to complete the startup module via your AWS Educate account. That's the most important thing to make you able to get your t-shirt and certificate. Second step, you have to head to the Scape Hub quarters, which is of course located at the Scape building. Yes, the one that is at Somerset MRT, close to there. Um, you can come during weekdays, obviously excluding public holidays from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. or 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. There will be someone there at Scape that will help you. You can look, um, it will either be myself or my two other colleagues, Jelina or Alice, we will, somebody will be there at these times, don't worry about it. And then the third step, of course, is on site itself, you have to log into your AWS Educate account and show us your startup batch and that you have completed the whole module. So the batch will look something like that. Um, and yeah, so we would preferably not accept screenshots because we're not sure if it's your own. Um, we would prefer if you log on and then you show us that it is indeed your account so that we can get the t-shirt and certificate to yourself. The collection is available from 23rd November. So from next Monday onwards, we won't be open today, unfortunately, because it's really the end of day. Um, all the way to the end of the year from 31st December to 2020, both quantity and sizes while stocks last as well. So um, please come down as quick as possible if you want to secure your particular size and to ensure that you definitely have a t-shirt for yourself. Um, yeah, so all of this will be provided to you via email once again so don't worry about if you forget a certain thing so the address and all our opening hours will be there for you and if you have any inquiries about this whole process please drop us an, an email or a message at hubquarters at skate.sg once again if you have any questions about the AWS educate platform just that do not email hubquarters escape.sg because we don't have the access backend please drop an email to the Amazon the AWS educate team um, the, their email as well will be provided to you in this email that will be sent out to you after this event. All right. And so the next thing that I think you guys are looking forward to is the virtual career fair. So here's the link for your use. The QR code is also mapped to this link as well. And once again, I will be passing the time back to Valerie. Uh, if you are here, Valerie, to share more about the virtual career fair. Yes, I see you. Okay, and I'll just stop my share screen. The link will still be in the chat if you need to get back to it. And if you have any questions, yes, please put them in the Q&A so I can get back to you as well, especially about the shirt and stuff. All right, okay. Thanks, yep, so thank you, Natalie. So um, this virtual career fair is actually happening tomorrow, Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So if you click onto the link, it will lead you to this brazen career fair. 
right? So here are all the exhibitors that are coming on board, which I will show you later. So you can actually speak to um, all of them. You know, there's no limits on how many companies you can speak to. But you know, each for each booth, you can only speak like about ten minutes to the representative. Okay, so to register, you can just click register now and you'll be brought to this page over here. Yep, so this event registration page where you can book your city, country, and it's also important to upload your resume because when you are chatting with the representative, which is like the HR personnel, they will be able to see your, represent, uh, your resume on the site as well. So they can simultaneously uh, evaluate you as a candidate, right? You can link your LinkedIn here, which will be good because then they can, you know, network with you after that as well. So, yep, here are some of the questions that we'll be asking you to fill up with. And, yep, so if you, after your registration, you'll be brought to this event lobby. So, for now, you will not be able to chat with the representative yet. But tomorrow at 10 o'clock when the event goes live, you'll be able to chat with them, right? So, as you can see, here are all the different booths. So, to chat with the representative, all you need to do is just click on enter and then you'll be brought to the booth itself. Right, so all these representatives are like HR personnel or branding person or recruiters from the company, you know, that can potentially hire you. So this is a brief introduction about the company. And then here are the different like opportunities available. So like for internships and recent graduates, you can click on this link. For early professionals, you can click on this link. Right, so these are all the representatives here, but just to note is that um, you'll be automatically assigned to a particular representative. So you cannot choose which representative you like to speak to. Everything is automatically assigned. Right, so you can find out more about the company through the social media page here. So it's the same format for all the different companies. Yeah, but you, there are business as well as tech roles available. So, you know, if you do not see like any particular role that you're interested in, well, you still can speak to the representative to find out more because um, there is a limit of up to seven job postings on this brazen platform. So sometimes they might not list out all the available job opportunities, right? So... Tomorrow, when the event goes live, you will see a button here where you can click to chat now with um, the potential recruiters. Yep, so I think that's all for the virtual career fair. It's a very simple one-day event. But of course, you know, if you are on a, looking for more jobs on a long-term basis, you can always head on to AWS Educate Job Board where you can source for more jobs as well. Yep, so that's all from my side. I will pass the screen sharing back to you, Naki. Thank you. There is a question, uh, I think, for you. Um, for uh, Somebody mentioned for now, we can only see the profile, right? Uh, it's on chat, not Q&A. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, for now, we can only see the profile. Uh, by profile, what do you mean? Like, do you mean the profile of the company? If so, yes, you can only see um, the company's um, profile now. Uh, you can see, you know, what are the different job opportunities available, but you are unable to speak to any representative right now because the event is not live yet. So tomorrow from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., uh, you'll be able to chat with the representative. You know, some companies have up to six recruiters, some have three, so... Yeah, you can speak to them, but just to note that you will not be able to choose who you want to speak to. So it will all be automatically assigned. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Ali. If you guys have any more questions regarding both Redemption or the AWS Career Fair um, platform, uh, you can just drop them in the Q&A and we'll slowly get back to you as soon as possible. And just to really finish up um, the session, um, there are just two more things I'd like to do. So first of all, um, if you guys could just go to menti.com and enter this code, I think we really want to get some learnings from you guys and want to hear what you guys thought about this event and of course your key learnings. So that's one. Um, and the second one, I will be launching a poll in a bit just to get you know your thoughts on today's session, yesterday's session, as well as the whole session as a whole so that we can really get more insights from you guys, which, is, which are our attendees. 
so I'm just going to stop share for this for now. Our The code will come out soon. Again, don't worry about it. Um, it's going to be here. So I think you can see at the top of the screen. So if you can, just help to like input some of your learnings. Um, yes. MVP, amazing. Okay, a lot about MVP. Anything else? Yeah, we'd like to see more of your thoughts. And once you're done with that, oh, a lot on it. Okay, MVP is huge right now. Okay. And I will also launch the other poll. If you're done with this mentee, um, you can just help us fill up the poll as well. That would be really, really great so that we can really help you guys um, build more, uh, you know, build more programs that are more re relevant to you and will be a lot, uh, you know, it will really help you in your journey to become um, entrepreneurs and founders as well. Painkillers for people. Yes, your MVPs being painkillers, right? And uh, finding the right co-founders. Yes, trifecta of ideas. AWS Educate, yes, a really great learning tool for everyone. Even if you know you don't, you um, you know you realize that you know, oh, I don't want to create my own startup, or I don't really want to be a founder. A lot of other things that you can learn on the AWS Educate platform. You know, um, everything that's to do with the cloud as well. A lot of amazing things there for you to upskill yourself. Um, yeah, in a pretty you know, in a basically a very free way, I guess, in that sense. So, really great platform. Culture, yes, our last panel today, which was really good. <clears throat> and I think a lot of people downplay the importance of culture. Nowadays, especially in startups, it is really important your, you know, your 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 people, your employees are uh, is one of your most important assets really to help to grow your business. Finding the right people, creating the right culture is very important. Yes. Ecosystem components. That's interesting. Ecosystem components. Legal, yes, our first panel for today. Um, what else is there? Fundraising considerations. Yes, yeah, something that's super important and very interesting uh, for most people and is something that is always of intrigue for all of us. And thank you, um, everyone that's also filling up the poll right now. Really great to see. Awesome. All right. And I think so it's kind of, you know, settled down already. Thank you so much for your learnings. And it's really nice to see that, you know, you have taken away some some things uh, from this uh, webinar. It really comes out from your key learnings. And it's great to see that, you know, MVP is something that you guys uh, have really clicked on and have really taken away from this particular session. Um, Yes, I see something to chat. Thank you for the past today. Thank you guys for heading down as well. Um, I've really enjoyed speaking to all of you guys um, throughout these past two days. Um, please feel free to connect um, with us on LinkedIn as well at Skip SG. Um, you can just keep up with all of our upcoming programs, um, be it on the realm of entrepreneurship or startups, but we also have other programs um, surrounding our other clusters. Like if you are interested in the arts like dance and music or even esports or, you know, media, we have a lot of different type of programs that you can tune into and you can look forward to. So thank you so much, guys, for your learnings. Um, I think it's this, this view is really nice for me to have. Um, I've given you guys about three minutes to pause. I think those have pulled, probably already finished polling, so I'm just going to end it. Thank you so much. Um, if I don't see any other questions for ourselves about um, anything, right? Yes. Okay. Great. And yes, I think that wraps up our session for these two days thank you again and obviously of course you guys at the hub quarters when you guys come down to collect your shirts i uh, of course again once again the last reminders if you have not registered for your aws educate account please do so that is the most important thing you have to do to get your shirt as well as your certificate um yes and thank you so much i hope that you guys of course attend the virtual career fair that will happen tomorrow um and all the best in your job searches if you do um, I do see something in chat. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you guys for the thank yous. <laughs> um, hi, do we have to get three badges in order to get the startup badge? 
Um, no. So the startup module, I believe, is only one module. So you just have to finish that one module to get the startup batch. However, um, please do um, continue to, you know, do the other modules to really, you know, better your learning and increase your learning. Um, it always helps, you know, um, and if you would like to speak to the AWS Educate team more about the other badges, please do reach out to them. Um, I think they are probably currently still in the chat as well. So if you'd like to continue to um, yeah, talk to them, you can. Yes, Brian, you get the startup batch after you complete the quizzes. So when you do it, and I did it myself, and it was really great. Uh, it's a really great experience. So once uh, there are like sort of like short quizzes after, after every topic. Um, so once you complete them, and I think you have to pass, uh, if I'm not wrong, 70%. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, sorry the AWS team, but yes, about there. Um, yes, then you do get the startup batch once you finish. How do I know if my account is K-12? Um, could the AWS team get to this anonymous attendee, please? Yes. Yes, um, please continue dropping your questions um, on the... Valerie from AWS is getting back to you. Yes, continue to drop your questions. If not, yes, we will see you at the hub quarter if you guys can slowly drop off um, this session and yes and a post event email will be sent out to you with all the details so don't worry about missing out on anything thank you guys do we have to sign up for the aws edu if you guys already have an aws educate account i believe you just have to finish the startup batch um just to get the t-shirts and the cert so don't worry about if you had an account Higher. We just need to see that you get the, the startup batch. Uh, yeah, I'll clear this question. If I'm wrong, the AWS team is going to be an answer. You guys can just add on. All righty. Do we have to collect the shirt physically? Yes, unfortunately, um, you will. Um, our office is open. The escape office is open, um, and you can collect this the shirt there. If you need the address, everything will be sent out to you again. I have an AWS account, but I can't find the tab to attempt the quizzes for the startup batch. Um, from my experience, it might be on the top. So when you log in, um, it might be on like the cloud thing. Um, let me try to share screen actually maybe it might help i'm sorry i'm not like a educate expert per se but i would try my best if not um the aws team you guys can just jump in to answer this question Um, all right, I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, so for mine, um, I also just have these three badges, but they aren't these ones. Um, what I did was I went to advanced learning and the startup badge is here. Yeah, because I already completed it. Um, I already have it. Um, so I can't press start. So uh, you guys can just click the start button to finish it. And once you're done, I believe, um, oh, it's not here. It's um, yeah, it's somewhere. Yes, yes, that's how you can access the AWS startup batch. And if you need to see whether you got the batch, you can click on my backpack and then you can see it here. But this is for my, my particular account. I believe some accounts are a little bit different. No worries, Gunting. It was nice having you. Thank you for the question. Yes, please drop us any more questions if you have. I will keep this. Um, webinar open um, till about 5.30 or so. By 5.30, I'll just 
slowly um, kick everybody out. So yeah, if you are done, you can just take your leave. No worries about it. Um, yes, and thank you guys again for coming and drop. Once again, just keep dropping any questions if you have. Um, yeah. Is it possible to let our friends collect the t-shirt on behalf of us? Okay, so um, so long as your friend has complete has actually came for this event, <clears throat> so on our back end, we will we will be able to um track on who has came for this event. Um, uh, tomorrow schedule a link. Okay, yeah, I I will repeat it, Joel. Give me a minute. Um, yeah. So uh, first of all, they have to have came for this event. So actually, like logged on and attend this this webinar. Um, the second, they of course have to finish the startup batch. So they, their account has to show that they have completed. If you can see my screen, um, I've gotten the batch. So we have to be able to see something like this. Um, and then the third one is they have to give you access to their account because we would like to see you like log in to their account and then show it instead of just showing a screenshot. That would be the most preferable um, so that there isn't any um, disputes on whether they actually have the batch. So that will be the best. And so, yes, in that sense, it is possible for you to collect for your friends so long as they have all these three um, criteria set down. Okay, Joel, I'll just repeat the part on um, tomorrow's schedule. Um, just stop share. Um, give me a minute. Okay. Um, so, okay, I'll go through the redemption first. So for the redemption, um, people, ha you have to first of all complete your startup module via your AWS Educate account. So once you have completed that, and then you can head down to the Skate Hub quarters, which is located within the Skate building, the one near Somerset. Um, and you have to come during weekdays um, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. and 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, this is, of course, excluding public holidays. Um, so once you're there, you have to log in to your AWS Educate account and show us that you have this particular badge. So this particular AWS startup badge. If you don't have it, we are unable to give you the shirt and certificate. Um, so we would prefer for you to log into your account instead of just show us the screenshot so we can verify that um, you have that account. Yeah. Um, so yes, collection will be available from 23rd November, so that's next week, Monday, all the way to the end of the year. So um, whilst, uh, while stocks last, because um, the quantity and sizes are limited, so once you finish your batch, please um, like get to get to hub quarters as soon as you can so that you can secure your the size that you want. Um, yeah, and all of this will be provided to you guys by email. Don't worry about it. I will send an email out right after this, or after I close this webinar, so don't worry about it. And you can drop us an email as well regarding the t-shirt and certificate collection. For the virtual career fair, um, this is the link. Um, it's somewhere in chat floating around, or you can just scan the QR code. The link will also be sent via the email, so don't worry about missing out on that or you know, uh, forgetting this particular link. Um, yes, the, the career fair will run from, I believe, uh, Valerie, please correct me if I'm wrong, 10 a.m. all the way to 6 p.m. tomorrow. Yes, so it, it's, a, it's a, you know, come as you, come as you want kind of model. Of, of course, we would like you to spend a few hours there to really get to know the companies and to really make the most out of this career fair. So, yes, um, I hope I did cover that. Joel, if you have any other questions, um, you can just drop it back. Um, I have an AWS account. Okay, I did answer this already. Is there a dress code for the career fair? No, I don't believe so. It is a virtual career fair. Um, so of I, I I don't think there's a there's a video camera. I think everything is based on like chatting and like chat box, chat bots and boxes. Sorry, there's no bots. There are real people there. Chat boxes. Yes. So um, no dress code. I think. Yes. Oh, if you want to add on to that, right? Um, actually, if we have enabled the video and audio function, so if the HR personnel wants to uh, have a video and audio chat with you, actually, they can invite you to a video audio chat. Uh, so usually, I think what most people do is that since everyone is working from home now, they will just like wear a formal shirt on the top, then <laughs> for the bottoms, you can wear your Bermudas or you know your shorts. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Betty, for coming. 
Um, yes, yeah, so be, be comfortable, but be presentable, I guess, just in case, um, you know, any employers want to talk to you. Um, so for those people that have, oh, uh, um, sorry, King Yu, um, AWS team, please get to King Yu's question. Thank you so much. Um, for Felix and Kwon Hua, um, you guys did mention that you didn't join yesterday's webinar or you kind of missed the webinar. Um, so long as we have your name on one of the webinars and we see that you have attended or made the effort to attend our webinars, uh, don't worry, you will still be eligible. Unless you really didn't attend at all, then we are unable to provide you with the t-shirt answer. Yes. Thank you, Valerie, for clearing that. Okay, um, please drop any more. Oh, sorry, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. tomorrow. Sorry, guys. 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. virtual career fair. I got my times wrong. Yes, please go during that time and not 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Okay, if you guys have no more questions, um, you guys can go. So I know that um, there are no more clarifications that needed that needs to be made. But yes, if anything, um, please just drop us an email. Or if not, if you want to reach me really quick, uh, the escape team is, of course, available on LinkedIn. So is the AWS team. You can connect with us there. I have a question. Thank you for this event. Thank you, too. OK. Um, Valerie, do you need me to share this, my, my screen again? Yeah, I think that would be great. Okay. Thank you so well, much, Natalie. No For Joelle, uh, your Natalie is sharing her screen okay. right now, so you can see how you can access the other badges from your K-12 account. Okay, so I think when you guys get here, you guys should see kind of this screen. So these are the three badges you see, so you're kind of wondering like, oh, where do I find my setup badge? So you can go up, and then you can go to Advanced Learning, so click this tab. And then when in Advanced Badges, um, you should be able to see the startup badge um here yeah so you can just click on it i already finished mine so you can't i can't start on it but you can of course start on yours if you haven't finished when you come to our um our offices to collect the shirt all you need to do is go to my backpack scroll all the way down and that's where you can find your advanced learning badge yes and i hope i answer your question sorry may i know where i can find the video recording of yesterday's session everything will be uploaded onto the youtube onto skip's youtube channel um a little bit uh, uh, like a little bit later give give our um, editing team a bit of time to splice all the stuff um yeah so it will come out in in a few days so don't worry about it i don't have the backpack on my account um aws team can you help them Thank you. Do I have to complete all the modules in the starter batch? Yes, you do. Um, as you can see, there are like six little bars on this thing. I think each bar is one module. Um, so you do have to finish everything to complete the startup batch. Only when we see that you have completed and all six bars are filled up, then we can provide you with the shirt and the setup. <coughs> Okay, it's one minute to 5.30. Um, please put your final questions um, on the Q&A if you do have any. Alrighty, I think nearly everybody is about okay, I'm guessing, because I'm not, oh, I just have one chat. Okay, that's Valerie. All right, um, I think that's good. I think everybody is okay, hopefully, with everything. If, of course, if you have any other questions, please, um, you can drop us, you can drop Skip an email or a message at our email if you have anything to do with regards to t-shirt collection or certificates. If you have any issues with AWS Educate account, please drop an email to the AWS team at apj-educate at amazon.com. That's the way that you can get your, your answer the quickest um, instead of going through Escape because we'll just redirect you back to um, the, Amazon, the AWS team. Yes. And if that is all, thank you so much and we'll see you 
at the hub quarter space. I'll start to kick you guys out. I'm very sorry. But yes, have a good weekend, everybody. And have dinner soon. Bye. Okay, I'll start to kick you guys out. Hello, Alice. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still removing something. No, 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 she was just. <coughs> Give me a minute.